Chapter 11 The next morning after breakfast I crossed over to Dimitriotis' table. He had been in the village the previous evening, and I hadn't bothered to wait up until he returned. Dimitriotis was small, very plump, frog-faced, a corfio, with a pathological dislike of sunshine and the rural. He grumbled incessantly about the disgusting provincial life we had to lead on the island. In Athens he lived by night, indulging in his two hobbies, whoring and eating. He spent all his money on these two pursuits and on his clothes, and he ought to have looked sallow and oily and corrupt, for he was always pink and immaculate. His hero in history was Casanova. He lacked the Boswellian charm, to say nothing of the genius of the Italian, but he was, in his alternately gay and lugubrious way, better company than Mitford had suggested, and at least he was not a hypocrite. He had the charm of all people who believe implicitly in themselves, that of integration. I took him out into the garden. His nickname was Melly, or Honey. He had a childlike passion for sweet things. Melly, what do you know about the man over at Borani? You've met him? No. I he shouted petulantly at a boy who was carving a word on an almond tree. The Casanova persona was confined strictly to his private life. In class, he was a martinet. You don't know his name? Congis. He pronounced the C-H hard. Midford said he had a row with him, a quarrel with him. He was telling lies. He was always telling lies. Maybe, but he must have met him. Popo. Popo is Greek for, tell that to the Marines. That man never sees anyone. Never. Ask the other professors. But why? Ugh. He shrugged. Many old stories. I don't know them. Come on. It is not interesting. We walked down a cobbled path. Melly disliked silence. And in a moment he began to tell me what he knew about Conchis. He worked for the Germans in the war. He never comes to the village. The villagers would kill him with stones. So would I if I saw him. I grinned. Why? Because he is rich and he lives on a desert island like this when he could be in Paris. He waved his pink right hand in rapid small circles, a favorite gesture. It was his own deepest ambition, an apartment overlooking the Seine, containing a room with no windows and various other peculiar features. Does he speak English? I suppose. But why are you so interested? I'm not. I just saw the house. The bell for second school rang through the orchards and paths against the high white walls to the grounds. On the way back to class, I invited Melly to have dinner with me in the village the next day. The leading estiatoris of the village, a great walrus of a man, called Sarantopoulos, knew more about Conchis. He came and had a glass of wine with us while we ate the meal he'd cooked. It was true that Conchis was a recluse and never came to the village, but that he had been a collaborationist was a lie. He had been made mayor by the Germans during the occupation, and had, in fact, done his best for the villagers. If he was not popular now, it was because he ordered most of his provisions from Athens. He launched out on a long story. The island dialect was difficult, even for other Greeks, and I couldn't understand a word. He leant earnestly across the table. Dimitriotis looked bored and nodded complacently in the pauses. "'What's he say, Melly?' "'Nothing a war story, nothing at all.' Sarantopoulos suddenly looked past us. He said something to Demetriatus and Rose. I turned. In the door stood a tall, mournful-looking islander. He went to a table in the far corner, the islander's corner of the long, bare room. I saw Sarantopoulos put his hand on the man's shoulder. The man stared at us doubtfully then gave in and allowed himself to be led to our table. He is the Agogiati of Mr. Conchis. The how much? 
He has a donkey. He takes the mail and the food to Barani. What's his name? His name was Hermes. I had become far used to hearing, not conspicuously, brilliant boys called Socrates and Aristotle, and to addressing the ill-favored old woman who did my room out as Aphrodite, to smile. The donkey driver sat down and rather grudgingly accepted a small tumbler of Retsina. He fingered his kumbologi, his amber patience beads. He had a bad eye, fixed with a sinister pallor. From him, Meli, who was much more interested in eating his lobster, extracted a little information. What did Mr. Conchis do? He lived alone, yes, alone, with a housekeeper, and he cultivated his garden, quite literally, it seemed. He read. He had many books. He had a piano. He spoke many languages. The Akojati did not know which. All he thought. Where did he go in winter? Sometimes he went to Athens and to other countries. Which? The man did not know. He knew nothing about Mitford visiting Barani. No one ever visited. Ask him if he thinks I might visit Mr. Conchis. No, it was impossible. Our curiosity was perfectly natural in Greece. It was his reserve that was strange. He might have been picked for his sullenness. He stood up to go. Are you sure he hasn't got a harem of pretty girls hidden there, said Meli. The Agogiati raised his blue chin and eyebrows in a silent no, then turned contemptuously away. What a villager! Having muttered the worst insult in the Greek language at his back, Meli touched my wrist moistly. My dear fellow, did I ever tell you about the way two men and two ladies I once met on Mykonos made love? Yes, but never mind. I felt oddly disappointed and it was not only because it was the third time I had heard precisely how that acrobatic quartet achieved Congress. Back at the school, I picked up, during the rest of the week, a little more. Only two of the masters had been there before the war. They had both met Conchis once or twice then, but not since the school had restarted in 1949. One said he was a retired musician. The other had found him a very cynical man, an atheist, but they both agreed that Conchis was a man who cherished his privacy. In the war, the Germans had forced him to live in the village. They had one day captured some Andarte, resistance fighters from the mainland, and ordered him to execute them. He had refused, and had been put before a firing squad with a number of the villagers, but by a miracle he had not been killed outright and was saved. This was evidently the story Sarantopoulos had told us. In the opinion of many of the villagers, and naturally of all those who had relatives massacred in the German reprisal, he should have done what they ordered. But that was all past. If he had been wrong, it was to the honor of Greece. However, he had never set foot in the village again. Then I discovered something small but anomalous. I asked several people besides Demetriadis, who had been at the school only a year, whether Le Verrier, Mitford's predecessor, or Mitford himself, had ever spoken about meeting Conscious. The answer was always no, understandably enough, it seemed, in Le Verrier's case, because he was very reserved, too serious, as one master put it, tapping his head. It so happened that the last person I asked over coffee in his room was the biology master. Carazoglo said in his aromatic broken French that he was sure Le Verrier had never been there, as he would have told him. He'd known Le Verrier rather better than the other masters. They had shared a common interest in botany. He rummaged about in a chest of drawers and then produced a box of sheets of paper with dried flowers that Le Verrier had collected and mounted. There were lengthy notes in his admirably clear handwriting, and a highly technical vocabulary, and here and there professional-looking sketches in Italian ink and watercolor. As I sorted uninterestedly through the box, I dropped one of the pages of dried flowers, to which was attached a sheet of paper with additional notes. This sheet slipped from the clip that was holding it, 
On the back was the beginning of a letter which had been crossed out but was still legible. It was dated June 6, 1951, two years before. Dear Mr. Conchis, I am much afraid that since the extraordinary, and then it stopped. I didn't say anything to Karazoglo, who had noticed nothing, but I then and there decided to visit Mr. Conchis. I cannot say why I suddenly became so curious about him. Partly it was for lack of anything else to be curious about. The usual island obsession with trivialities, partly it was that one cryptic phrase from Mitford and the discovery about Le Verrier, partly, perhaps mostly, a peculiar feeling that I had a sort of right to visit. My two predecessors had both met this unmeetable man and not wanted to talk about it. In some way, it was now my turn. I did one other thing that week. I wrote a letter to Allison. I sent it inside an envelope addressed to Anne in the flat below in Russell Square, asking her to post it on to wherever Allison was living. I said almost nothing in the letter, only that I thought about her once or twice, that I had discovered what the waiting room meant, and that she was to write back only if she really wanted to. I'd quite understand if she didn't. I knew that on the island one was driven back into the past. There was so much space, so much silence, so few meetings, that one too easily saw out of the present, and then the past seemed ten times closer than it was. It was likely that Allison had given me a thought for weeks, and that she had half a dozen more affairs. So I posted the letter rather as one throws a message in a bottle into the sea, not quite as a joke, perhaps, but almost.